Hi, I'm Mark Rosanna, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primer Vision Network. Today we have our EIA show, and there's a lot to go through given the data that's come out. So first off, we want to look at you know some of the high-level numbers. So we did have a draw in crude of 430,000 barrels, and we want to look at what does that mean in total. So we had some unplanned downtime uh, coming out of the, uh, the the Gulf of Mexico, which pulled down uh, your refinery runs by about 2%. So we actually went from 86.7% to 84.7%. And we had imports drop just as we had exports pick back up. So one of the things that we were saying last week was that there was some some disconnect between imports where they were, where exports were, and now we had a big makeup number. And when we look at what has happened so far, there were draws across the board There were some decent draws from gasoline, which normally happens this time of year, given the Columbus Day weekend. You know, we normally have downtime. This we had extra downtime versus historics, and then Dislit continuing to be in the more bullish uh, backdrop. So one of the things that, as we look forward into next week and beyond. We expect to see additional builds in crude, builds in uh, gasoline, but this lid is going to be the one that, uh, you know, is it going to come back up? Is it going to really kind of stay here? And that's really going to be this unknown as we start to have some of these refiners uh, come out of downtime, uh, unplanned downtime, because some of the downtime that has been planned really doesn't end until we get into the end of October, the first week of November. So one of the things we want to look at going forward, you know, because there's something there's something for the bulls in this, there's something for the bears in this, you know, it's just going to be a, a matter of where, what time frames are you looking at at this point? So when we look at just the crude numbers in general, here you can see that there is that dip in terms of uh, storage. But then when you look back through 2019, when you look at 2017, when you look at 2016, and even uh, and even that high point of 2020, you can see that we normally have this dip this point in time. And a lot of this is just driven based on where we're at kind of peak downtime for uh, refiners. You have some some shifts in terms of when imports are coming through. And we also have the Columbus Day weekend, which again, just is is really kind of lining up. So when you look at what this is going to be going forward, we expect to see builds continue along that very seasonal pattern as we've been talking about versus 2019, uh, 20, 2015, and 2018 as we go forward. The question is really going to be what happens with distillate because distillate is going to be that swing. I, I know uh, everyone has probably heard that there's going to be an additional 300,000 barrels a day upwards, and then people have said a million barrels a day. The question is going to be how much is really going to move through? When does winter store? What does weather look like? And how does gas play into this? So here are some interesting things where the global energy crunch is making winners out of oil refiners in Asia as a shortage of gas and coal sparks a rush to secure alternatives, lifting margins. So as we've said last week and the week before, we had India, Japan, South Korea starting to increase runs in order to address this. Asian gas oil cracks uh, could narrow in the coming weeks as the outlook for winter supply gets clearer and a regional surplus widens, according to FGE. Assuming normal weather, fundamentals point to a drop to 13 dollars a barrel. FG said uh, adding the current market perception are uh, overheated with the surplus in the Asian market widened to almost 500,000 barrels a day by early 2022. Now, that's that's an estimate in terms of where things are when you look at what are some of the shifts in general. So we have to see right now, how is winter setting up? What is storage looking like for middle and heavy, uh, heavy distillate slash residual? And how much crude is going to be taken in by Asia? Because we st- we now had some renewed uh, bids coming out of India for West African crude. That's gonna, we'll we'll know more by Friday in terms of how much is being uh, how much is being purchased. And then we do have teapots that have been allotted additional capacity for the end of the year. So we want to see how much of this crude that's been sitting in West Africa, that's been sitting in the Middle East, that will start to move into some of these regions. And, and again, that you're being incentivized to create distillate. So you want to see how much distillate is going to be available as we head into the winter months. 
The other thing, when we look at uh, Fujara, Fujara did have a, a big increase in storage, which is one of the things that we were saying, where you had this timing delay of an increase in exports as purchases were made. Now you have that backstop in terms of refilling that storage. And we're going to continue to see that as, as Europe can, uh, continues to pull uh, additional product into its market. But you're actually now seeing it reverse a bit, and you're seeing Europe being incentivized to send it into Asia when you look at the fuel oil side. So it all comes down to quality and grades in terms of who can burn ultra low sulfur diesel, very low sulfur diesel, who can burn high sulfur fuel oil. So these are the different shifts that we're going to have to look at to see who's long, who's short, and where. And that's going to be a way to play that more on the crack side in terms of some refiners will win, some will lose, and some will be able to, to kind of manage this back and forth as we go through and get closer to the, uh, the winter months, which really, I mean, just given where things sit is typically the second or third week in November, depending on when we start to get that freeze. Then when you look at days of supply for crude oil, again, it's looking a little bit better just because we've had such a big drop. In refinery run rates, so when you you know just even though we had that small dip in uh, in crude storage, you're going to see some of that uh, offset because we did have that sizable drop in refinery run rates. So then when you look at some of the uh, adjustments, as we talked about with the Middle Eastern oil products, so Middle Eastern oil product arrivals in Europe, mostly middle distillate, may gain month over month in October, which we've already started to see as UAE shipments have been moving in. 13 tankers moving about 922,000 tons have arrived in Europe so far this month. And then we have a 13 tankers are sailing west with about 970,000 tons and 10 are in, are, are in route to the Suez Canal, but you aren't yet signaling Europe. So it, they could continue to the U.S. And we'll talk about why in a minute. For November, one tanker is underway to Europe with another six that have been booked. So that's going to be something where that's going to move over. But we're now we're starting to see some of the uh, shipments come the other way as well. But we'll talk about that in a minute. And the reason why we look at that in terms of supply for crude oil in the U.S. is because typically the U.S. sends distillate from Pad 3 into, pad, uh, into uh, Europe. But now you're starting to see some of that reverse and some of that is coming into Pad 1 because Pad 1 is really the biggest driver of this shortage in the distillate pool, which again is going to attract some of these additional cargoes which is why when we start looking at what normally happens this time of year, this is looking at total U.S. commercial oil storage and products. So you can see we're still, we're still off the lows from 2021, and we still had that normal drop when you look at 2019, which is that yellow line, when you look at 2018, and then when you look at 2017, we typically have some of these drops as we continued in 2020. So it's still something seasonally normal, obviously from a lower point when we look over the last five to six years. So the question is going to be how much of this comes back. And, and I think we follow very closely to what happened in 2019, where you start to get a, uh, an increase, again, very moderate, not like we're going to get this huge explosion higher. When you look at, uh, at imports, when you look at exports, it's just going to be kind of a, this steady build as we go through the end of the, uh, the, end of the year just based on what is being demanded in the market right now in terms of crude versus product, where gasoline is going to be uh, going to continue to build a bit, while distillate remains that, that shortage, which we're going to have to pull in more, not only crude to make the distillate, but also any floating distillate that is available in the market. So with that being said, October loading shipments of clean fuels from Asia to the Americas uh, gained pace with volumes rising to 190,000 tons as of Monday, which is actually going higher right now. We're, uh, uh, you know, the what we've counted, we're, we're closer to about 330,000 that should stay around, let's call it about 330 to 390. We'll see some of those movements adjust over that time period just because we do have that demand within the U.S. in general. So this is, again, something that is going to be interesting to watch as gasoline storage. Uh, transatlantic arrivals uh, from Europe to the U.S. dropped to about 188,000 barrels a day versus about 332,000 barrels a day for the previous week. It's the lowest arrival since August 12th. Uh, U.S. also received jet and di uh, diesel from Europe during that period, which should be elevated 
and well, should remain elevated really. And you can see that we're right back down to the lows for 2021. But when you look at the time period that we're in right now, we typically get this drop, especially when you look at the highs of 2020, when you look at 2019, when you look at essentially this is the period that you get this drawdown, then you start to balance out and you start to see those increases as we get deeper into winter. And as diesel heating oil get, becomes, again, the focal point that throws off gasoline, people do relatively less during the winter months, which again, just puts more into gasoline in general. So really nothing uh, out of the ordinary when you look at the uh, the normal drops. You know, one of the things that uh, when you look at where the drops are, uh, I'm thinking that we have something closer to 2019, where you start to get some of this this uh, this bounce a little bit earlier because you see the drop was a bit more a uh, bit more aggressive. And it's not that we're going to get this huge build, but it's just going to be more of this kind of a, a sideways move going into the next two weeks. And then we'll see that gradual build as we go through the end of the year. Now, distillate is where we continue to see a lot of the bullishness and a lot of this interesting backdrop, really, because when you look at where things sit right now, we continue to be at the lows. We're now at the lowest points in 2021, which is typically when we start to see some of this pivot towards this additional uh, capacity. But again, we continue to see some of these shortfalls. Now, European exports of diesel gas oil to the Americas uh, increased in October so far, just given the amount of sh the shortages on pad in pad one. Uh, refined product shipments in the reverse direction are likely to drop month over month in October. So right now we have 17 tankers carrying about 11.4 million barrels of oil have arrived in Europe, so that we're sending oil into that region. They've increased a bit, but we should see some of that uh, some of that gas oil diesel come into the U.S. as as gasoline remains at the lows because when you look at some of the backdrops, you know, given just the ARB has closed a bit while it remains open on the distillate side, which will com continue to bring from Europe into the U.S., while jet fuel is at a fairly stable level and, and uh, a pr fairly close to the 29-year average. So there's nothing to say one way or the other, just given we, we came off of that normal spike that we had uh, due to Columbus Day weekend. And now we're going to see some of that normalcy as we go through the remainder of October into November. So then when we look at the curve, you had the curve moving up again, another nice little spike. Uh, you know, we're above 75 going into 2022. When you look at essentially September, uh, almost a, a year out from now, you're above 75, you're above 70 as you go through 2023. Uh, so again, there's there's a lot of support to see some of this activity get pulled forward. You know, there's a lot of opportunity and it continues, especially on the NGL side, which is something that uh, we haven't had in a long time. When you look at the three hydrocarbon uh, streams, all of them are making money. All of them are positive. And you're starting to see not only rigs react, but as we've been talking about every Friday, you know, we're, we're, we continue to see uh, completion crews getting, and again, getting to that cap of about 275, as we expect to see rigs uh, running well past that, just to, to replenish and to stop some of that duck drawdown. And you'll see that carry into 2022, creating some of that running room as we get out of that seasonal lull. On the COVID side, uh, UK has been trending higher. Uh, you know, when you look at what happens in the US normally, typically they lead us by about two weeks. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a new variant, shocker, I know, it's a coronavirus, so to think that it mutates. Uh, it's so far, nothing crazy has been seen. You know, you had some cases going back up, but again, the vaccine is holding. Even if you get it, you're not getting as sick as you normally are. Things are trending in that direction. Uh, worldwide, we've kind of stopped going down just because we've had some increases in Europe. Uh, the U.S. continues to kind of hold these lines as the U.K. is increasing. But when you look at Asia Pacific, that continues in a downward trajectory, uh, especially when you look at Vietnam, Japan, way back down, Malaysia, South Korea. Uh, you know, some of the ones that are starting to, to kind of balance out Vietnam, but again, we don't see anything too much, but we do see Singapore reaching new highs and then China has a renewed outbreak, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
Then when we look at crude draw, uh, draws, just getting more specific. So here's that draw, 430,000 barrels. Uh, you can see that it was really driven by pad two. So when you look at what happened in pad two, we had a big drop in Canadian imports. Again, remember as line three is coming online, you have some of these uh, some of, some of this, these headwinds as you get some of this normalcy, some of these movements. You still have the lumpiness from crude on rail, and that's really being recognized the most in pad two. So when you look at pad one, had a draw of 3, 000, uh, 30,000 barrels. Uh, pad three had a build of 1.9 million. Uh, pad, five, uh, pad five had a draw of 250,000. Pad four, a build of 150,000. So really, when you look at what was driving the draw, pad two had that draw of 2.22 million. Cushing had a draw of 2.32 million. So when you look against the five-year average, you can see that we're 47.9 million below the five-year average, but it is really all driven by pad two and Cushing with pad three actually 6 million barrels above that five-year average. As we continue to see some of the pressure points, especially when you look at exports just not really going anywhere, again, just holding with well within our range that we've talked about, and that's going to keep some of this. Now, the question next, the next question really, is when does that start to, uh, to kind of trickle back into Cushing? But when you look at the backwardation, you're really being incentivized to sell it now because you're not being paid to store it. So you're trying to pull this through. It's just when do we start to see some of this flipping? And right now, it doesn't seem likely. Now, when you look at the uh, production was down 100,000 barrels uh, from 11.4 to 11.3, a lot of that is just movement in terms of when uh, when some of this is recognized. We continue to have us closer to about 11.55 million barrels a day. So then when we look at what is happening around the world, so land storage total had a small, uh, had an increase, uh, you know, just it, it's really because we had a bounce in east of Suez, we had a little bit of a stabilization west of Suez. So we had a little bit of an increase in land storage. Uh, that's going to continue this week, even though we did have that draw in the U.S., we did have a build in Europe that offsets that draw. So west of Suez is going to continue to have between U.S. and ARA. We'll continue to have that small uh, increase. Uh, east of Suez is something similar. We're, we're continuing to see a little bit of those increases in general. Now, one of the things that I forgot to mention when you look at the U.S. commercial versus SPR. So the U.S. Uh, commercial had a draw of 430000 but then we had a draw of about 1.69 million out of the SPR in, a, in accordance with what we've been talking about after what was announced following IDA. Now, we still have some of these shifts in terms of when this crude shows up uh, and what was purchased during IDA. So when you look at floating storage, still remains elevated. Uh, you can see that there was a build in the west of Suez just because we had builds in floating storage in uh, Europe and the North Sea, even though we had a decline in the U.S., and then when you look at east of Suez, we had a big spike in, um, in West Africa, a smaller spike in the Middle East, and a small draw in Asia. But we'll talk about that more in segment three. But again, there still remains a lot of crude sitting in the offshore market. And then when you look at total uh, oil and products, you can see that the things have narrowed a bit as we had some gradual builds uh, in, uh, in total crude stocks, land and floating. You can see just in terms of where total is, we're still above that, um, that three-year range when you, when you add together, again, land and floating. And then when you look at total oil product stockpiles, you can see that things have started to kind of flatline. And one of the things that we've been talking about with that flatlining is that the comps get easier as you get into November, which is where we think we're, we're going to come and kind of fall into this uh, a bit more of this normalcy as we get into the, no, the early November months. So then when we look at what has happened so far in, uh, on, on TomTom and Baidu, obviously for China on the congestion side, you can see that for the most part, uh, the Americas have come down a bit, but that's just because we did get a big spike. Uh, not big, but we got a spike because of the long weekend that comes down uh, a touch. China had that bounce following Golden Week. Now with the renewed, uh, again, renewed is, is relative because it's about 17 cases. You're starting to see a bit more pressure coming in. Not to say that you're going to get a big drop. You're just going to be just below normal. 
Europe is starting to come down a bit. Then when you shift to Google mobility data, you can see that we're just kind of sitting here uh, anywhere between 88 and 92% of normal, while Apple mobility data continues to show that elevation, but it's just a matter of how is it calculated and where some of those shifts are. But you can see Europe is kind of the biggest driver to the, uh, again, to the normalcy, if you will, while we continue to see some stability in the other regions, which when we talk about gasoline implied demand, the EIA reported about 9.6. We were we were between 9.2, 9.3. So again, as we were saying, you're going to get an, an overshoot to the upside, you will get an overshoot to the downside, but it should average out closer to that 9.2 million uh, number. Then when we look at what happened in pad three, uh, it's the third highest we've had. Uh, we had another uh, counter seasonal build. But it, again, it's just it's fairly normal to where we were in 2016. I, there's nothing too crazy one way or the other. You could say, oh, well, look at where we sit. It, it, it's just fi finding this new normal. We, we think that there's a bit more of a leveling off as pad one uh, attracts a, a few more barrels. And it's just going to be, um, I think, a bit more of a focus into pad two at this point, just given the available storage space as Cushing uh, has fallen to a new 2021 low. Yeah, one of the things that we were expecting is, is some of this lumpiness. And, uh, but again, averaging it out, we still think that we come closer to that 15 year average. It's just going to be a matter of when does some of this crude from Canada show up? When does some of this pad three crude back up into Cushing? And we just haven't seen that yet. And that's something that we're still expecting just based on spreads. But again, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's a good market to be selling crude in right now from the backwardation side. Now, when you look at runs, uh, runs went from 86.7 to 84.7%. So that was down 2%. But remember, uh, whether the different backdrops, it's always going to be shifting in terms of where is the availability. So here you can see runs uh, fell, uh, even though utilization rates were down 2%, total crude coming out was only 71,000 barrels. So it's just a matter of the process that was taken down as we've talked in the past, because different processes, either you're using some of the lighter ends, some of the middle ends to make something different and how much new crude is being lost. So is, is nominal at best. Uh, it was all really driven by pad three, which had some of that unplanned downtime with 167,000 barrels coming out, while pad two had that increase of about 87,000 barrels a day. We just expect pad three to bounce back. So we should get much closer to that 86, 87% somewhere within that range, which we'll show in a minute. So then when you look at imports, imports were down 170,000 barrels a day. Uh, it was really driven by a big drop in pad five. So pad five dropped about 498,000 barrels a day. Cause remember that lumpiness remains in there just because of, uh, the issues at the ports. So you'll continue to see some of that movement. Uh, pad three had a small step up of 209,000 barrels a day and pad two, a small increase of 93,000 barrels. So again, you're, you're seeing some of these movements. We expect pad two to continue to be elevated and pad three to see this steady increase, not so much a big increase week over week, but just when you look at uh, there's uh, some steady, steadiness in general of kind of setting this this floor and then seeing some of this walk up over the next uh, few, really into the second week of November, depending on when some of this, these barrels show up from both West Africa and the Middle East that were purchased during Ida. So implied demand had a nice pop. Uh, here you can see the implied demand side on finished motor gasoline increased 448,000 barrels a day. Uh, we were expecting that bounce from about 9.186 to about 9.2, 9.3. Instead, we had that, that big uh, jump up. Uh, DISTI was right in line with what we were saying, kind of that, uh, that 3.9 to 4.3. So we came into about 4.278, so right in line. Uh, JET uh, disappointed a bit to the downside. We were expecting a little bit more of a pop to about 1.5, which just means that we'll probably get another decent number next week. While propane, uh, you know, held at about uh, just decline of 28,000, which is still over a million. We still continue to see a lot of implied demand over the next few weeks. Then when we shift to uh, floating storage, floating storage dropped in the U.S. as what was available has been pulled through. We, we expect to see some of this, again, not this huge increase, but some of these boats uh, show up over the coming few days. 
And then when you look at pad two, as we were saying, we were going to get some of that counterbalance. When you look at typically we have a continuation to the downside, a little bit of an increase, but we expect more Canadian crude to come through, which will push us further to those highs. Now, when we look at the refinery run rates, you can see that we're now well below the 29 year average. Uh, that's something, again, that unplanned downtime came through. We had another uh, disruption today. It's just a matter of when is this captured? We expect to see that bounce back up and much closer to that 87% as we go through the next week or two, and then gradually moving ourselves back to 89% and then closer to 90% as we get into the middle of November. So now that we've gone through that, we're going to go much deeper into U.S. Uh, products and what is that? What, what do we what do we think demand is going to do through the end of October and then into November? When you look at gasoline, jet, ethane, propane, and um, and distillate in general, with again distillate being that that strong bright spot as we head into the uh, winter months. 